As we move into the second segment, we're going to be looking at the world's need for a Savior. You know, God is so kind and so loving and so merciful. 1 John 4, 14. And we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Why did the world need a Savior? What was the salvation that the world needed? God's original intent for man was to be a three-part being, body, soul, and spirit. Man's original relationship with God was as God's under-ruler, having open communication with him, having such a working relationship that God even decided to bring, you know, to bring the animals to Adam so he could name them. Genesis 2, 19. And out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. That's a pretty good working relationship when God comes to ask your opinion, what you ought to call them. This is how God taught Adam language in order to be able to communicate with Eve. Genesis 1.26 And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. And God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth, and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. When God created man and woman, he created them in his image, which according to John 24 is spirit. God gave them dominion over all the earth. God then blesses them and reminds them that everything was theirs to utilize. With one stipulation, Genesis 2.16, Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. If they ate of the fruit of the tree of good and evil, which was strictly forbidden to them, in that very day they would die. Unfortunately, for all of mankind, that is exactly what happened. The devil came, disguised as the serpent, to Eve and directly contradicted what God had said. When she chose to believe him over what God had said, she ate of the forbidden fruit, along with Adam, and they both died. Since Adam physically lived for 930 years, it was not the physical death that died that day, but rather it was a spiritual death. They died spiritually. Let's go back and look at that, Genesis 3, 4. And the serpent said unto the woman, you shall not surely die. For God does know that in the day... <laughs> the serpent is quoting God and knowing the insight of God. For God does know, here's why God's doing this, that in the day you eat thereof, your eyes are going to be open, and you shall be as God. Is this. It's singular in the text. You shall be as God, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. Tragedy occurred when Adam sinned. Since he died spiritually, man now was only two-thirds of his intended nature. He lost spirit, the part that was made in the image of God. When he sinned, he lost spirit, which was his way to directly communicate with God. The relationship, the communion that he had with God was seriously impaired. Anything that was based on the spirit nature had died. Again, John 4, 24, God is a spirit. Uh, that's very important. So many people have the image of God wrong. Spirit is God's likeness. It's his image. Both Adam and Eve have been created in the image of God with spirit, which had set them apart from the animals. God is very protective of his image, of his likeness. Exodus 20, verse 1. God spake all these words and said, I am the Lord thy God which hath brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. The text reads, are in my face. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. Don't make any likeness of anything that's in the heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that's in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, but showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me 
and keep my commandments. And here Psalm 97, 7 says, Confounded or shamed be all they that serve graven images, that boast themselves of idols. Worship him, all ye gods. The worship of false images brought trouble upon the land. Amos 5, 26. But you will have borne the tabernacle of your Moloch and Chion, your images, the star of your God, or your star gods, which you made to yourselves. Therefore will I cause you to go into captivity. You're going into exile beyond Damascus, says the Lord, whose name is the God of hosts. The one true God does not want his image distorted. He is extremely image conscious. Genesis 3.15 And I, God, will put an enmity. Enmity is a condition of separation and hostility between thee, the serpent, the devil, and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It, the seed of the woman, shall bruise thy, the serpent, or the devil's head, and thou shalt bruise the seed of the woman's heel. See, this verse sets the central theme of all the scriptures. The red thread of the Redeemer, which is interwoven throughout the Old and New Testaments, an offspring of the woman is promised, who will ultimately destroy the adversary and his works. Since there are only two people on earth, what do you think their discussion centered on while they were drinking coffee? Right? Sports, movies, you know, uh, video games, none of that had been invented yet. So their entertainment were the animals, the stars, and finding food. You know, weather was great, so not much to talk about there. So we get to Genesis 4.1. And Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain. And she said, I've gotten the man, or I've gotten the man from the Lord. Turns out to be the first murderer, Cain. But the line of man then continued through Noah. Noah told his sons and their wives about the coming one. The prophecy concerning the promised seed was passed down from, genes from generation to generation. As the peoples of the earth migrated from the Tower of Babel to populate the earth's surface, they carried this knowledge with them. The prophecy's meaning became distorted or lost by some, but others kept the truth of it embedded in their hearts so that they looked for a coming Redeemer. They looked for the promised seed of the woman, the anointed one, the Messiah. God promised Abraham that the promised seed would be his offspring. In Genesis 21, 12, God told Abraham that in Isaac shall thy seed, the Christ, be called. You know, Abraham had eight sons and all, but the promised seed of the woman would come through Isaac. It tells us this in Galatians 3, 16. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He said not unto seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is the Christ. Immediately after the fall of mankind, God offered mankind a solution. He promised a Redeemer. This promise was fulfilled in the Lord Jesus Christ. He was the Redeemer who accomplished what was needed on behalf of mankind and by God in order to reinstate that spirit nature. God had been put in a position of not being able to reinstate spirit immediately. And mankind had been put in a position of needing to do something to get the spirit reinstated. Years later, the Lord Jesus Christ accomplished what was necessary so that spirit, which had been lost, could be reinstated. That spirit that was lost in Adam was regained by Jesus Christ so man could again be a threefold being. He made it available so God and man could share a spirit-based relationship. The spirit-based relationship being reestablished has been anticipated throughout the Old Testament. Genesis 2-7 And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. When Adam lost spirit, he became just body and soul again like he was before God had created spirit in him. He had a breathing body, and he was a living soul. This was his image. This was his likeness. Genesis 5.3 And Adam lived 130 years and he begot a son in his own likeness after his image. And he called his name Seth. And the days of Adam after he had begotten Seth were 800 years and he begot sons and daughters. And all the days of Adam lived were 930 years and then he physically died. This records Adam's physical death. He had died a spiritual death at the time of his original disobedience when he lost spirit, his connection to God. You know, the absence of something is called death in the Bible. Before he died, though, he had children who were born in his likeness and in his image. They were just body and soul people without spirit. Romans 5.12, working translation. Therefore, as by one man the sin entered into the world, and the death by the sin. 
even as the death passed unto all men, by which all have sinned. In fact, sin was in the world until the law came, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, the death still reigned from Adam until Moses, even unto them who had not sinned after the likeness of Adam's transgression, who is a type of him who was to come. The death that Adam brought into the world, first and foremost by his sin of disobedience to God's commandments, commandments was the loss of spirit life. The loss of spirit life is referred to in this passage as the death that reigned over all people even before the law was given to Moses. Even though there was no law for the people before Moses, they were, were still dead without spirit life, even as they were under the law. The one man who had caused sin to enter the world was Adam. He brought sin that resulted in death for all. By his transgression, sin entered the world. And by his sin, death entered the world. The death, that death is spoken of as having passed unto all people, for that all have sinned. Thus death reigned over all people. Although all people who were born after Adam and Eve had breathing bodies and living souls like Adam, the death brought about by Adam, the loss of spirit, passed to all people. The spirit that Adam had must have been life, such that without it, people would have been considered dead, because that's stated that way in Romans 5.12 and Genesis 2.17, Thou shalt surely die, that we just read. Adam's son Seth was born in the image of Adam after Adam had lost the spirit life. Thus Seth would have been born with just body and soul life. Romans 5.12 attests to that lack of spirit life in Seth as well as all the other people by saying that the same death had passed to all people. Romans 5.16 And not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift. For the judgment was by one the condemnation. Condemnation is katakrima, meaning the sentence pronounced against someone. Here it refers to the sentence pronounced against Adam according to the standard that had been stated in Genesis 2, 16 and 17. Verse 18 of Romans 5. Therefore, as by the offense, or therefore, as by the trespass of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. These verses also describe Adam's trespass or offense as the cause of mankind's judgment to condemnation. Adam transgressed God's commandment, and thus the judgment stated in 2.17, the day you eat, you shall surely die, would have, been, would have been passed. Adam would have been condemned to the death spoken of by God, which was the loss of spirit life. That condemnation and death passed to all other people, Ephesians 2.1. And you hath the quicked, who were dead in trespasses and sins. This death came about by Adam's transgression. Death was the penalty for Adam's transgression, and it had been passed on to all people. Thus, even though people had Adam's image, breathing bodies and living souls, they were dead in trespasses and sins, and that they were without spirit life. A body and soul person receives access to the physical world. They are allowed to relate to the physical world. Without the spirit from God, mankind was denied access to relate to God because God's spirit. During the times following Adam's fall, Prior to the accomplishments of Jesus Christ, the Spirit of the Lord came upon certain people, and it could also depart from some of them, like Saul. 1 Samuel 10.10 10. And when they came thither to the hill, behold, a company of the prophets met him, and the Spirit of God came upon him, Saul, and he prophesied among them. See, Saul manifested that Spirit by prophesying among the prophets. Saul was not created or born with Spirit, but rather at a certain time in his life, the Spirit of God came upon him. Unfortunately, that Spirit did not remain on him, as we read in 1 Samuel 16, 14. But the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul. Adam had caused sin, condemnation, and the death to enter the world, and that the condemnation and death had passed to all people. Thus the Spirit of the Lord upon certain people in those times before Christ could not have been the same as the spirit life that Adam once had. Which brings us to the question, what was the reason for spirit being put upon certain individuals in the Old Testament? Verse 13, Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brethren, and the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. The Spirit of the Lord came upon David, who would become all of Israel's second king. 2 Samuel 23, 1. Now, these be the last words of David. David, the son of Jesse. 
and the man who was raised up on high, the anointed of the God of Jacob. And the sweet psalmist of Israel said, The Spirit of the Lord spake by me, and his word was in my tongue. The God of Israel said, The rock of Israel spake to me. He that rules over men must be just, ruling in the fear of God. By way of the Spirit of the Lord, which was upon David, God communicated his word to David. When the Spirit of the Lord came upon certain people in those days, it was means by which God could communicate his word and will to an individuals who would in turn teach and show God's word and will to, all, to other people. When you read about the people who had received the Spirit of the Lord in the Old Testament upon them, you see that they manifested tremendous power and they were able to receive valuable information directly from God. They were able to do this by means of His Spirit upon them. As great as that spirit upon them was, it was not the spirit life that Adam once had, since all people, including those with spirit upon them, were dead, as recorded in Romans 5, 12 through 14. Now let's go to Numbers eleven sixteen. And the Lord said to Moses, Gather unto me seventy men of the elders of Israel, whom thou knowest to be the elders of the people and officers over them. Bring them unto the tabernacle of the congregation, that they may stand there with thee. And I will come down and talk with them there. I will take of the Spirit which is upon thee, and I will put it upon them. And they shall bear the burden of the people with thee, that thou bear it not thyself alone. Now we jump down to 24. And Moses went out and told the people the words of the Lord, and gathered the seventy men of the elders of the people, set them round about the tabernacle. And the Lord came down in the cloud, spake unto him, took of the Spirit that was upon him, and gave it unto the seventy elders, and it came to pass that when the Spirit rested upon them, they prophesied and did not cease. But there remained two of the men in the camp. The name of one was Eldad, and the name of the other was Medad. And the Spirit rested upon them, and they were of them that were written, but went not out into the tabernacle, and they prophesied in the camp. And there ran a young man who told Moses, Eldad and Medad, they prophesy in the camp. And Joshua the son of Nun, the servant of Moses, who was one of his young men, one of his choice men, that's how it reads, because it wasn't like he was young. When Moses was 80, Joshua was 53. So it wasn't like he was young. It was one of his choice men. And he answered and said, My Lord Moses, forbid them. And Moses said unto him, Envious thou for my sake? Would God that all the Lord's people were prophets, and that the Lord would put his spirit upon them. See, God being able to directly communicate with his people has been a heartfelt desire for him since Adam. His desires were that all his people could communicate directly with him. He sent his son into the world to die on behalf of all of mankind in order that all could be reconciled back to him and receive his spirit and be able to receive eternal life today. John three sixteen and 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Remember, God's desire is for all men, not just one particular group to be saved. 1 Timothy 2.4 tells us this, who, God, will have all men, and that includes women, to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. And in Ezekiel 18.23, have I any pleasure at all that the wicked should die, says the Lord God, and not that he should return from his ways and live? Verse 31. Cast away from you all your transgressions, whereby you have transgressed. Make you a new heart and a new spirit. For why will you die, O house of Israel? For I have no pleasure in the death of him that dies, says the Lord God. Wherefore, turn yourselves and live ye. See, during the Old Testament, men who received the Spirit of God upon them were able to receive revelation and could prophesy. And they could operate spiritual power. Men like Abraham, Moses, David, Elijah, Samuel. But a time was foretold where ordinary people would have the Spirit also. Joel prophesied 2.28 and 29. It shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. Also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out of my spirit. Joel, speaking by way of foretelling, speaks prophetically, and he's talking about God pouring out spirit. In the times of the Old Testament, there was an occasional man 
on whom God will place his spirit, but this is not talking about placing spirit only on men like Moses or Elijah or Amos or Joel. Verse 28. That I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Not just a few, not just a chosen here and there, but would it, it would be available to be put upon all flesh. We continue reading verse 28. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Not just one person, but the offspring. Everybody will have that ability. Verse 28. Again, as we continue to tear this verse apart, your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. You know, sons and daughters made it both sexes. Young and old makes it all ages. So from both sexes and the age of accountability tell the grave, it's going to be readily available. That's quite a prophecy. Prophetically, what had been lost by Adam is going to be reinstated for both male and female. Reinstated on the basis of young and old. And then verse 29 again, and also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I, will I pour out my spirit. Not just ruling class, not just prophets, not just men of the statue of Moses or Abraham or David, but children, old people, men, women, even those in the positions that wouldn't have qualified them to be considered in Isaiah or Jeremiah or Samuel. Prophetically speaking, the outpouring of spirit would be available to all who wanted it. So, the reinstatement of spirit was an intrinsic part of what they believed in the Old Testament, what God had revealed in his word, and what they looked forward to. They also looked forward to the one who would accomplish it, the one who was to bring this to pass. The promised seed, the Redeemer, the expected Savior was anticipated in prophecy, in the scripture, and by type. Now, type are events or practices or people which represent or which were anticipation of a coming event, a coming occurrence, or a coming person. The coming Christ should have been greatly anticipated. Isaiah 53, 6. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He's brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before shearers is dumb. So he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living, for the transgression of my people was to be stricken. When was the first transgression committed? Well, by Adam in Genesis 3. What was its consequence? Loss of spirit. So the Redeemer would make spirit available again. Verses 9 and 10 of Isaiah 53 as we continue reading. And he made his grave with the wicked, and with the rich in his death, because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth, yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. See, the prophet Moses led Israel out of bondage in Egypt toward the promised land. Not only did Moses receive God's law, but he also prophesied of a coming prophet whom Israel must follow. The coming Messiah would be raised up from among the brethren and would be a prophet like unto Moses. Deuteronomy 18.15 tells us this. The Lord thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee, of thy brethren, like unto me, like unto Moses. Unto him shall you hearken. And verse 18 I, the Lord, will raise them, the children of Israel, up a prophet from among their brethren, like unto thee, like unto Moses, and will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. When Jesus Christ was on earth, those who knew this prophecy were convinced that he was the true Messiah, because he was this great prophet. John six fourteen. Then these men, when they had seen the miracle that Jesus did, said, this is of truth. This is that prophet that was going to come into the world. When Jesus therefore perceived that they would come and take him by force to make him a king, he departed again into a mountain himself alone. Well, what do you do if he is that prophet? Well, you take matters into your own hands. And you tried to help fulfill one of the other prophecies, that he would be king. Well, he will be king, but not on earth at that time. Not only would the Messiah be a prophet, and not only would he be of the statue of Moses, he would also be a priest. Psalm 110.4 The Lord hath sworn and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And this is fulfilled in Hebrews 5.6, second part of the verse. 
Thou, Christ, are a priest forever, after the order of, of Melchizedek. See, the genealogy of the Messiah started with Abraham, and it was passed on to Isaac, then to his son Jacob, who God renamed Israel. Jacob had 12 sons who eventually fathered the 12 tribes of the biblical nation called Israel. One of those 12 sons was Judah. It was from Judah, prophesied by Jacob on his deathbed, that the scepter, which was the symbol of kingly rulership, would not depart. Genesis 49.10 The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh come. And unto him shall the gathering of the people be. Now unto Shiloh come refers to the Messiah's coming. The Messiah would be the final ruler of Israel from the tribe of Judah. It was prophesied that the promised seed was not only to be a prophet and a priest, but, he was, but the Messiah was to be king. Thus the children of Israel had a hope of a coming ruler, a Messiah descending from Judah, sent from God to deliver them physically. Numbers 23, 21. He, the Lord, has not beheld iniquity in Jacob, not in the nation of Israel, Neither hath he seen perverseness in, uh, in Israel. The Lord his God is with Israel, and the shout of a king is among them. Well, the shout of the king was Israel's joyous expectation of the coming Messiah. How meaningful this hope was supposed to be to them. Uh, 2 Samuel 7.12 When thy, David's days, be fulfilled, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers. I, the Lord, will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Verse 16. And thine house and thy kingdom shall be established forever before thee. Thy throne shall be established forever. God promised David that he would establish David's royal throne forever. 1 Kings 8.25 Therefore now, Lord God of Israel, keep with thy servant David, my being Solomon's father, that thou promises him, saying, Thou shalt not fail thee a man, none of David's descendants in my sight to sit on the throne of Israel. Psalm 89, 3 and 4, I, the Lord, have made a covenant with my chosen. I have sworn unto David my servant, Thy seed will I establish forever, and build up thy throne to all generations. Selah. The Messiah was to come out of the royal line of David and his son Solomon and would sit on the throne forever. These key scriptures tell certain aspects about God's promised seed, the Redeemer. There are many other types from the Old Testament that in some way alludes to or foreshadows the coming Savior, like the sacrifices, the offerings, the law, the tabernacle, the temple. God used these and many other things to illustrate and prepare his people for the coming Messiah. In fact, the scriptures as a whole, when rightly divided and understood, pertain to the Christ. The promised seed is the central subject of the Bible from Genesis 3.15 to Revelation 22.21. He's the underlying subject. He's the red thread of the Word of God. Even historical events are recorded in such a way as to show the coming Messiah and His work. Throughout the time frame of the Old Testament, there had been the anticipation of the Redeemer, of the coming Savior. The reinstatement of a spirit-based relationship was a part of mankind's hope. The coming Redeemer would be a prophet like Moses and be the Savior who would redeem man from sin. And the first sin that had to be redeemed from was the one that Adam had, prop Adam had propagated at the first, which resulted in the loss of spirit. Go to John 3. There's some insight. There's a man of the Pharisees. In fact, his name was Nicodemus. And he was a ruler of the Jews. The same king to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God. For no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time of his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus answered and said, Verily, verily, I say to you, except a man be born of water, First birth, oh, my water broke. Born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I say unto thee, you must be born again. The wind blows where it lists, and thou hears the sound thereof, but canst not tell where it comes or whether it goes. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus answered and said unto them, how can these things be? 
Jesus answered and said unto him, Are you not a master of Israel, and you don't know these things? Jesus didn't coddle Nicodemus. He asked what was wrong with him. He was supposed to be a master of Israel. He was supposed to be a learned one, one who taught other teachers. Jesus Christ was asking Nicodemus as a learned man, how come he was having so much trouble with spirit being made available again, since it was recorded in the scriptures in many places? Even the Lord Jesus Christ prophetically spoke about the reinstatement of spirit that would be the basis for the spirit-based relationship. Luke 11, pick it up in verse 9. And I say unto you, Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asks receives, he that seeks finds, and him that knocks it shall be opened. If a son shall ask bread of any of you that is his father, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will for a fish instead give him a serpent? Or if he wants egg, will you offer him a scorpion? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him. This is prophetically speaking. As soon as the necessary work was accomplished to make it available, spirit could and would be offered. John 4.21 Jesus says to this woman, Believe me, the hour comes when you shall neither in this mountain nor at Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship, you know not what. We know what we worship for salvation of the Jews. But the hour comes, and now is, when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeks such to worship him. God is the Spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. See, the Lord Jesus Christ was speaking prophetically about spirit being reinstated and needed for true worship. Worship in spirit and in truth. We go to Luke 24, 49. And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. Here the Holy Spirit is called the promise of my Father, and it's also called endued with power from on high. It was a promise throughout the Old Testament. Soon it would be made available to all. Acts 1.4 Being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait until the promise of the Father which said, Hey, you have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. The resurrected Christ spoke about the gift of Holy Spirit that it was going to be made available very soon. And it was being referred to as being baptized with spirit. Acts 2.1 And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind or a rushing forceful breath. It filled all the house where they were sitting. There appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it sat upon each of them. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And they began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit God gave them utterance, as God gave them the words to speak out. Peter had done things that required spirit before. Jesus had sent him and the others out to heal. That would require spirit. But here they were all filled with the gift of Holy Spirit and manifested it by speaking with other tongues as the Spirit, as God gave them the utterance. Peter explains whose power they were utilizing. And when he was finished, we read of the people's reaction to what they had just seen and heard. Acts 2.37 Now, when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. It was being made available to all there. More than just the apostles of certain select spiritual ones, you know, like kings or prophets. The gift of Holy Spirit was made available just like it had been spoken about in the Old Testament. Just like the Lord Jesus Christ had said, it was available to all. And soon all would even include the Gentiles. The rest of the people on the globe, they could receive it too. At the time of the very first occurrence, when it was finally possible to make Holy Spirit available again, after Jesus Christ had completed all that was required for man's redemption and salvation, God 
marked that special occurrence, that monumental occasion, he marked it with speaking in tongues. What's so important about speaking in tongues? Here was the point in history that had been anticipated since Adam decided to go against God's revelation and had lost spirit. For the first time since Adam's day, God was in a position to have an open spirit-based relationship. Men, women, young, old, not just an Abraham occasionally or David or an Elijah, but what did God choose to mark this great occurrence with? Speaking in tongues. Acts 2, 6. Now, when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. They were all amazed and marveled and said one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And how hear we every man in our own tongue when we were born? And then we jump down to verse 11. He lists different nations and he gets to Cretes and Arabians. We do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. Speaking in tongues is not something, in God's opinion, that, that is unimportant. Something that should be regulated to 12th position, far behind other things. Well, why? Because it was indicative of the reestablishment of what had been lost way back in Adam's time, spirit. It was the evidence of the fulfillment of all these prophecies, prophecies from Genesis 3 all the way through. Even those prophecies spoken by the Lord Jesus Christ, and it was now available. They were baptized with the Holy Spirit, endued with power from on high, received the gift from the Father, and when they were, God didn't think it was insignificant. God marked it worthy of a phenomena. Tongues of fire from heaven, rushing mighty wind, and then they spoke in tongues. This was not a little insignificant matter in God's opinion. This was something he had been working forward to, talking about, helping people to get to that point when it could be accomplished. Ever since Adam and lost spirit, and that relationship between Adam and God, which had been spirit-based, which had been severed. At that monumental occasion, when what had been lost could be reestablished, what was it that God marked that great occasion with? Something that had never been done or heard before. Something that had not been experienced before. He marked it with speaking in tongues. The great father of all who believe, Abraham, he never spoke in tongues. The greatest prophet tell Christ, the great lawgiver Moses, never spoke in tongues. The shepherd king, King David, never spoke in tongues. Here was something greater than what these men could do, and it was available for men, for women, for young, for old, for handmaidens, for servants. And they were doing something that even the great prophet Elijah hadn't done. Something even an Isaiah had never done. Something that even John the Baptist could not do. They spoke in tongues, and they worshiped God via the Spirit. Look at how significant God held it to be. Wow, what a day. God thought very highly of it. Speaking in tongues is not something insignificant, not something of little importance, of little value. It was the great event that marked the reestablishment of a spirit-based relationship that had been lost in the days of Adam. Acts 10, verse 1. There was a certain man in Caesarea named Cornelius, a centurion of the band called the Italian band. He was a devout man and one that feared God with all his house, which gave much alms to the people. He prayed to God always. He also was a Gentile. But he was lacking one thing. He was not born again. He had not been born from above. He hadn't received the Spirit unconditionally yet. His piety, his giving, and his prayer life were recognized by God, but he still hadn't received the Spirit yet. Verse 3. He saw in a vision, evidently about the ninth hour of the day, an angel of God coming to him and said unto him, Cornelius. And when he looked on him, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? And he said unto him, Thy prayers and thy alms are come up for memorial before God. And now send men to Joppa and call for one Simon, whose surname is Peter. He jumped down to verse 33. Because he got Peter, and he brought Peter there, and Peter taught him the word. And as he taught him the word, let's see what happens, starting in verse 33. Immediately, therefore, I sent to thee, and thou hast well done that thou art come. Now, therefore, we are all here present before God, to hear all things that are commanded of thee of God. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, Hmm, of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation he that fears him and works righteousness is accepted with him. 
The word which God sent unto the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ. By the way, Jesus Christ is Lord of all. That word, I say, you know, which was published throughout all Judea, began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. Verse 44, While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all of them which heard the word. And they of the circumcision which believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Spirit. For they heard them, the Gentiles, speak in tongues and magnify God. At the household of Cornelius, when the Gentiles first received, they knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that they too had received the Spirit because they heard them speak in tongues. That was the undeniable proof that they had received the gift of the Holy Spirit. Gentiles, for the very, very, very first time, were born from above, born again, had received the gift of the Holy Spirit, and when they did, they too spoke in tongues. When Peter and the other Jews saw it, they knew without question that they also had received the gift of the Holy Spirit, because without new birth Holy Spirit, they would never have been able to speak in tongues. Acts eleven seventeen, For as much then as God gave them the like gift, as he did unto us, who believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, what was I that I could withstand God? The like gift, isos, the equal gift to the Jews. No difference in the gift of Holy Spirit being given by God to the Jews or to the Gentiles. Both received a complete, powerful, incorruptible spirit from God. It was available now because of the completed work of Christ. Again, Moses, Abraham, David, none of them did this. It wasn't available until after the Lord Jesus Christ had completed all the work that was necessary for man's redemption and salvation, and then the gift of Holy Spirit could be shed forth for the very first time on the day of Pentecost. Thus, we have Gentiles, Gentiles, Gentiles doing things that Moses, Abraham, David, Isaiah, Samuel, Elijah couldn't do. They are speaking in tongues. They are proving that they had received the gift of the Holy Spirit. Those who are born again have the privilege, they have the opportunity, they have the ability to be able to speak with tongues, to be able to bring what Joel prophesied about, spirit and men, women, young, old, any walk of life into manifestation. They have access to receive all the benefits that speaking in tongues brings, to be able to give thanks well, to edify themselves, to magnify God, to make perfect intercession by speaking in tongues, we can do all these wonderful things that weren't available before Jesus Christ had accomplished all that was required for man's salvation and redemption. But since he has accomplished all that is required for man's salvation and redemption, we have access to be able to do it. Speaking in tongues is the proof that spirit has been reinstated for all of mankind to receive. We are blessed to be able to manifest this power from God when we speak in tongues. God can once again have a spirit-based relationship with anyone who desires it and believes regarding the Lord Jesus Christ and His being raised from the dead.